Kathy, would you give us an opening prayer? Yes. Thank you. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for the opportunity to attend this class and to learn about all the sacrifices and the, the great work that the people who helped restore this gospel and this church did. And please bless us that our minds will be opened, that we will understand and that we will be taught by the Spirit. Please also bless Vivian as she teaches that she will be prompted to say the things that will help us understand better. And please bless her work and preparation for this class. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate that. You're welcome. This morning, uh, we're, we're talking about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. But as you see by the title here, we're going to center on the witnesses. Now, the reason I have the three witnesses here is that even though there were three witnesses and eight witnesses and also Joseph, which makes a total of 12, um, we don't have time to talk about everything under the sun, and so we're kind of going to set, uh, center on some of the experiences of Oliver, David Whitmer, and Martin Harris. So these are the three witnesses to whom the gospel, uh, the plates were shown by the angel Moroni and who bore the especial witness that is to establish uh, the work in the last days, and so we're going to center on them. Um, I want to tell you that in your manual uh, there is a considerable amount of material on the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Uh, there's a lesson on preparation for the coming forth and then a lesson on the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and these lessons are truly excellent and it's just a good exercise for you to read them so you'll have the background of some of the things that we're talking about. Now, when we left off last uh, Wednesday, we were talking about Isaac Hale and Emma and some of the struggles that went on in her life and how she, in August of 1830, uh, left Harmony forever and never saw her mother and father again. Uh, some other members of her family she did see again because eventually some of them moved west and some even lived close enough in Illinois for her to visit easily and uh, still the great grief of her life was to have her mother and father, her father particularly, re reject the testimony that her husband bore. And as we were talking about this it was obvious that there was enough said about Joseph Smith and enough peculiar uh, things happening for Mr. Hale to look at this as though it were a fanatical um, religious movement that Joseph Smith was starting and that he was an unstable kind of person. After he had associated with Joseph for a long time, it was obvious to him that Joseph was hardworking, that he was sincere, and that he was a, a good person. And at one point, the Hales um, began to believe some of the things that Joseph was telling them, but their belief was destroyed by Emma's uncle who came and testified so vehemently against Joseph Smith. There is one thing that I think is worthy of pointing out here, and that is that a fanatic who uh, evolves up a religion out of whole cloth or out of his creative imagination does not have the power to introduce the angels that he sees to other people. And here we have a system of witnesses in which Joseph Smith is not left to stand alone. Now the Lord said at a certain point, you will be destroyed if you don't have witnesses who are going to establish the work and who, are, who will back you up. By the time Joseph Smith left Harmony, Pennsylvania, there had been sufficient witnesses that Mr. Hale had opportunity to accept and to understand things which were obviously placed before him even though they were contradictory to the things that he experienced in his own mortal life but at the same time being a religious man these witnesses conformed to 
the theological or religious standard of witnesses as it was taught in the New Testament and in the Old. And so uh, Mr. Hale rejected in, in the final sense the witnesses that were sent of God when there was evidence and testimony that their witness was true. So we're going to start talking a little bit about these witnesses today and um, we'll go forward and take uh, two governing scriptures here. And they are long, but these are worth our looking at because uh, we see that the Lord laid the premise for what was going to happen here with the Book of Mormon. Which was the book that would change the religious course of history in the world, according to the prophecy of Joseph Smith's grandfather, Asel. And I've just given you Asel's words uh, when he says, I know that one of my descendants will promulgate a work that will change the course of religious history in the world. This was provided for from the beginning, even from Adam, we could say, because Adam prophesied of everything that was going to happen. But here we have Nephi talking about the revelations that Isaiah gave, and he declares in 2 Nephi 2, 27, 12 through 14, Wherefore, at that day, when the book shall be delivered unto the man of whom I have spoken, being Joseph Smith, the book, or the plates, shall be hid from the eyes of the world. Now this matter of witnessing is a matter of faith. The Lord gives the initial witnesses, and it is our responsibility to uh, judge from their testimony and to have their testimony uh, sanctioned to us by the Holy Ghost. But as the Lord said to Joseph Smith, um, I think in section, in section 10, it, even if people were to see these plates, if they don't believe you, they wouldn't believe the plates. Now there's something about that that is interesting because at a certain point when John Whitmer, who was one of the eight witnesses, became disaffected from the church, he, uh, he in a very angry um, tirade in Far West said, yes, I saw the plates, but I can't testify as to whether or not um, the interpretation was correct. Um, later, he made better statements than that, but at any, any rate, he, he in, a, in a moment when the devil was in control of him, um, said, yeah, yes, I saw the plates, but, but I can't determine that the message was actually true because he had lost uh, the Spirit of God in people who don't have the Spirit can't accept the witness. So this is an interesting thing. But here, the, I, Nephi, drawing on Isaiah, says that none shall behold it, save it be that three witnesses shall behold it. So way in the beginning, way back in Old Testament times, uh, a doctrine of two or three witnesses <clears throat> establishing every word was an established doctrine. And they will witness it by the power of God besides him to whom the book shall be delivered. This is a total of four witnesses here, and they shall testify to the truth of the book and the things therein. And their testimony, which comes by the power of God, is going to be that testimony wherein an angel shows them the plates and wherein they hear the voice of God declaring from heaven that the translation is true. And that is so powerful a witness that it can't be denied and if they did deny it, they would be destroyed. But this witness is so absolutely official that uh, it is the witness God requires the world to hear. And there is none other that shall view it, save it be a few, according to the will of God. And therefore we know that there were eight witnesses in addition to these three. The eight witnesses didn't see the angel and didn't hear uh, the voice of God, they did handle, heft, lift the, the plates and turn the pages and, and bear testimony of what they saw. Save it be a few to bear testimony of his word unto the children of men. Wherefore, the Lord God will proceed to bring forth the words of the book and in the mouth of as many witnesses as seemeth him good will he establish his word. The weight of this is tremendous. The, the Three witnesses primarily are the witnesses upon whose testimony the Lord's word is going to be established. 
So let's go a little further here. Now we're looking at ether. Uh, ether comes along also, uh, or actually previous to what Nephi had to say, and he is speaking also to the prophet Joseph Smith and to us. Behold, ye may be privileged that ye may show the plates unto those who shall assist to bring forth this work. Now when he says, you're going to show the plates to those who assist, this is, makes practical sense to you. Who else would be a witness? But someone who had already exercised faith in the plates, even though they had not seen them, and who had assisted the prophet to bring forth the work. Now we're going to center on these three witnesses, because in this period of time, these three persons probably did more to bring the work forth than anybody else. Now, we, I don't want to exclude Joseph's family, and I don't want to exclude Father Knight, because the Knight family did a great deal to sustain Joseph in the work. But when we got into a situation of working and of making things happen and um, laboring day and night to cause something to come forth, in the beginning, the per three persons who were involved so intimately in that uh, effort were the three witnesses. So these persons who were foreordained to take this position were the three who came into play in the beginning to assist Joseph in getting the book out. Because they did all they could to get the book out, they are the three who are chosen. And unto three shall they be shown by the power of God. This is a spiritual thing. Um, it's God's power that will show them when we, when we reason and we come to the highest authority possible. Obviously, it is the authority of God the Father. And therefore, these things are going to be shown by his power. Now, we get down a little further in this particular uh, scripture, and it's going to make that point. Wherefore, they shall know of a surety when they see these things that they're true. And in the mouth of three witnesses shall these things be established. And the testimony of three, and this work, in the which shall be shown forth the power of God, and also his word, of which the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost bear record. And this shall stand as a testimony against the world at the last day. So here we have, uh, in these words, the fact that the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost are bearing record, are bearing witness of this record that is going to come forth. Nothing could be more official. When we perform ordinances in the church, and we say, as we do in the marriage ordinance, uh, this blessing has come upon you in, in the temple ceremony, by the power of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, we are just saying everything uh, of eternity and all the power of God is directed toward this and nothing could be more official than what we have there. So this is a powerful statement. Now we'll go down, take a look at a general authority statement. So uh, from time to time we manage to put a general authority statement in here concerning our, our subject and this is Joseph Smith. Uh, Joseph Smith tells us when he is preparing to um, call these three witnesses, in the course of the work of translation, we ascertain that three special witnesses were to pro be provided by the Lord, to whom he would grant that they should see the plates from which this work, the Book of Mormon, should be translated. And these three witnesses should bear record of the same. Now when Joseph Smith is talking about this, uh, the matter has already come up in translation. So when Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were working on the translation in harmony, and they came across 2 Nephi chapter 27, and the verses that we've looked at, they recognized there was going to be a witness.
you have to excuse me there for a minute because it was time for me to sneeze so I'm sorry but here we're back together again so um, in this matter of translating it's come to the attention of Joseph and Oliver that this is going to happen but by the time we get to Ether whose uh, testimony we just read Joseph and Oliver have gone to um, Fayette where they continue working on the translation and while they're at Fayette they just they learn in the translation of the day as they were working all day long up in that little loft in that Whitmer home where it is hot and they're they are working laboriously to get this done that there will be these three witnesses called and in the evening when they come down from the translating room and the light has gone and they are um, probably sitting around by candlelight they discuss what they have translated in the day probably read portions of it to the family and as they are discussing these things they see that witnesses will be called and it begins to formulate in David Whitmer's mind as well as Oliver's and then Martin Harris comes down repeatedly to visit and see what is happening that they want to be the witnesses so we, here we have Joseph's statement and so in June of 1829 in a preface to what becomes section 17 Joseph Smith says almost immediately after we had made this discovery as we were translating and as we came across ether it occurred to Oliver Cowdery David Whitmer and Martin Harris who had come to inquire after our progress in the work that they would have me inquire of the Lord to know if they might not have of him to be these three special witnesses and finally they became so very solicitous and urged me so much to inquire that at length I complied and through the Urim and Thummim I obtained from the Lord of the Lord for them the following okay here are these men this uh, is interesting because at the time David Whitmer is the exact same age as the prophet Joseph Smith he's probably 24 years old Oliver Cowdery <clears throat> was 23 Martin Harris uh, I think was probably around age 46 and is obviously um, the older of the three but when we look at these pictures it doesn't always convey to us how young and how dynamic and how willing and how strong and how persevering they were um, with the age and energy that they had and so Joseph says to them I I will inquire of the Lord and through the Yerman Thummim he receives this particular revelation for them and it is June 1828 the specific day we don't know as we noticed at the heading there of Joseph's commentary about what brought this revelation forth but this is a, a an extremely important revelation because the Lord says to them I'm going to show you I'm not just going to show you the plates I'm going to show you everything that is concerned here I'm going to show you the breastplate the sword of Laban the sword of Laban was this was the paradigm um, object for these Nephites and Lamanites and the, the Nephite people particularly because it tells them where they came from and that their story is true and they carried this down all through their history producing it at, it at particular ceremonial occasions or when they were going into war to establish with the people who they were and where they came from you're going to see these things, you're going to see the Urim and Thummim, and all of these things uh, will be apparent to you when you become one of the three witnesses. So the Lord tells them, <clears throat> Behold, I say unto you that you must rely upon my word, which if you do with full purpose of heart, you have to exercise a lot of faith to do this. 
You shall have a view of the plates and also of the breastplate, the sword of Laban, the Urim and Thummim, which were given to the brother of Jared upon the mount when he talked with the Lord face to face, and the miraculous directors which were given to Lehi while in the wilderness on the borders of the Red Sea. And it is by your faith that you shall obtain a view of them, even by that faith which was had by the prophets of old. And after that, after that you have obtained faith and have seen them with your eyes, you shall testify of them by the power of God. And this you shall do, that my servant Joseph Smith may not be destroyed, that I may bring about my purposes unto the children of men in this work. Now when the Lord says here, I'm doing this that Joseph may not be destroyed, what, do you, what thoughts come into your mind about the intensity of this situation and the things that they are, are facing as they bring this book forward? Does anybody have any thoughts? Very quiet. Well, I think I've never considered the fact that the three witnesses would help Joseph, or keep Joseph from being destroyed. I'm not sure what the Lord meant by destroyed, though. You know, Kathy, that's a really good point. And so I am going to read from section 5, verse 33. In section 5, uh, the, prophet is, the Lord is talking to uh, the prophet Joseph Smith in March of 1829. Um, and he's, he, this is a revelation in which uh, Joseph is getting information for Martin, who came to him and asked him uh, for the Lord to tell him whether he was still acceptable to him after losing the 116 pages and so forth. And this is what the Lord said in verse 33. There are many that lay in wait to destroy thee from off the face of the earth. So already at this time, there are people who want to kill Joseph because of his testimony and because they know he's got the plates. Uh, if they were just seeking those plates for gold, I don't know that they would be so motivated to try to kill him as they were. But is, do you recall anything from the the instructions to Joseph Smith when he went on the 20, uh, 22nd of September 1823 up to the hill to get the plates that Moroni said to him about this. Remember this? We have to go back in our thinking. Moroni said, I'll give you a sign as to when the work has commenced. Do you recall the sign? No. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I think that was Laurel, whoever was being very honest there. Here's the sign. The sign is, as soon as the work commences, people will try to destroy your reputation and take your life. And when that happens, you will know that the work is going forward. Now you remember that, right? How yeah. Many? Yeah. Because, um, first of all, that makes sense uh, when we know that we're in the war with the devil. But we have to establish <clears throat> by the weight of witnesses that Joseph Smith was not alone. And um, he is in a position where his life would be destroyed if this didn't happen. So finally we get to our lesson considerations. And obviously it's going to take us a while to accomplish these considerations. Longer than I wanted it to take, but... What role did each of the three witnesses play in bringing forth the Book of Mormon? Martin Harris, an aide to Joseph, visits Anthon and loses 116 pages. This is a role of Martin's. Oliver acted as a scribe and a translator. David Whitmer acted as an aide and a secretary. Now, we'll be considering each of these things as time goes by, but today we are only going to get through Martin Harris, and I don't think that we'll get through all of Martin Harris today but we will continue with these objectives. Each of these men left the church, though two returned. How did this affect the testimony that they bore? Now this is a really interesting circumstance. I'm going to give you a chance to just tell me who, which two came back. Remember? 
Well, um, Oliver Cowdery did, and I thought Mar David Whitmer did not. That's correct. Oliver came back, yeah. David Whitmer didn't, and Martin Harris did come back. So as we go through this, by the time <clears throat> we get to the end of all of these considerations, we'll see some of that history. Now, uh, I want to introduce you a little bit to Martin Harris. And in reality, we're going to say a little bit more here um, than just Martin Harris's involvement. And my purpose in this is just to to make a little overview and remind us where we are. But here we have uh, a statement on Martin Harris and the involvement that Joseph Smith had with him prior to the time that uh, Joseph was introduced to, Mar to Moroni. Martin Harris, uh, born in 1783, died in, in Smithfield, Utah in 1875, was a highly respected and well-to-do farmer in Palmyra at that time. Now he had lived there, here we, we see, 35 years. Uh, he had been born elsewhere in New York, came to Palmyra with his father. His father is one of the settlers of that country. His father is still alive at, at the time of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. He wanted to show the 116 pages to his father. Um, but here we have, prior to his trips to Harmony, Pennsylvania, and New York City, when he took the characters and uh, went to see Charles Anthon, He'd lived in Palmyra 35 years, and we are told that as a boy, Joseph Smith had worked on the Harris farm for 50 cents a day, and that he and Harris had even wrestled together. Well, that might have been kind of a fun little experience for Martin Harris and Joseph Smith if it actually occurred. But the likelihood is, yes, he did work for uh, Martin Harris on his farm in Palmyra. Mother Smith says, uh, Martin Harris was an an old and valued friend. He was a confidant of my of my husband's, and so uh, they had loved him for a long time. And after the experience with the 116 pages, when Lucy and Joseph go down at the conclusion of the translation from Palmyra to Fayette, they call on Martin Harris and take him with them. And Lucy says, we dearly loved the man. In spite of his faults, we dearly loved the man. So we'll go a little bit further. Now here's a fun thing. Uh, there is a little known Harris autobiography. And it is short and sweet. And we're quoting from this now. And he tells us uh, a little bit about his life. In the year... 1818, 50, 52 years ago, so he's talking a long time hence. I was inspired of the Lord, this is two years prior to the first vision, and taught by the Spirit that I should not join any church, although I was anxiously sought for by many of the sectarians. I was taught that two could not walk together unless agreed. Um, so he's saying, I, I couldn't walk with people I didn't agree with. What can you not be agreed is in the Trinity, because I cannot find it in my Bible. Find it for me, and I am ready to receive it. Now here is a picture of Martin. Um, Lucy Mack says he was a confidential friend. And here we learn something very interesting. Father Smith mentioned the existence of the record two or three years before it came forth to Martin Harris. Others, sects, the Episcopalians, also tried me. They say, three persons in one God without body parts or passions. I told them such a God I would not be afraid of. I couldn't hold him in awe or fear him or have him in esteem. I could not please or offend him because he is the vapor. The Methodists took their creed from me. I told them to release it or I would sue them. Now, I don't know particularly what he's talking about here, but a creedal statement is what people believe about God, and he's annoyed with them over something. The Spirit told me to join none of the churches, for none had authority from the Lord, for there will not be a true church on the earth until the words of Isaiah shall be fulfilled. 
Now, when he's talking about, I had the Spirit telling me there wouldn't be a true church on earth until the words of Isaiah were fulfilled, we are going to assume that he is speaking about the words that applied to him, uh, the mission that he came with. If we're talking about him perceiving something about uh, the writings of Isaiah in 29, Isaiah 29, where Isaiah speaks of the Book of Mormon and of, of Martin's experience, it may be that he had a whispering of that in his soul. But he mentions specifically the words of Isaiah. So I remained until the church was organized by Joseph Smith the prophet. Then I was baptized, being the first, after Joseph and Oliver Cowdery. So he's directing our minds to April 6th, 1830, and claims that after Joseph and Oliver were baptized, he was next. I'm assuming that's what he's speaking of, but it may be uh, earlier baptisms that occurred before the church was established. So I have to say, however, that in the commentary of Brother Anderson on this, a uh, particular paragraph that I have here, he indicates April 6, 1830. And then the Spirit bore testimony that this was all right, and I rejoiced in the established church. Previous to my being baptized, I became a witness of the plates of the Book of Mormon. Interestingly, uh, one of the attacks that was leveled at Martin Harris at the time he joined the church was that he was a church shopper that he'd been a Quaker, that he had been a, a Methodist, that he had been a Restorationist, and so forth. And we know that he had been a Methodist and then a Universalist, just as Joseph Smith's grandfather was. So what we see here is a man not satisfied with religions of the day and searching. Okay, now we're going to come to a little section here on the early struggles of Joseph getting the plates and preserving them. One purpose in this is uh, we want to emphasize a little fact here, and that was that Martin Harris made it possible for Joseph to be moved out of the circumstance of persecution into a better circumstance where he could begin the translation. Joseph, on uh, September 22, 1827, went up to the hill and got the plates. As soon as he got the plates, he had an intense desire, in fact, he had this intense desire before he got the plates, to begin the translation, and he was anxious to begin it. But when he brought the plates home, he couldn't begin it because there was constant interference. And so Joseph says to us, when I was up on the hill that night on, in 1827 and getting the plates and Emma's down the hill and the wagon waiting for me, and the messenger gave them to me, he said that I should be responsible for them now, and that if I should let them go carelessly or through any neglect of mine, I should be cut off, but that if I would use all my endeavors to preserve them, which he had to do until he and this messenger should call for them, they should be protected. No sooner was it known that I had them then the most strenuous exertions were used to get them from me. Every stratagem that could be invented was resorted to for that purpose. The persecution became more bitter and severe than before, and multitudes were on the alert continually to get them from me if possible. Now one thing about Joseph Smith was he did not use hyperbole. And so when he says here, uh, multitudes were on the alert, He's just saying there were many, many people trying to get these plates from me. Now, we know from our past discussions that the rumors of Joseph Smith were just everywhere. They were all over Palmyra, all over Fayette, all over Harmony. Everywhere uh, Joseph went, people were talking and telling stories and um, you know, outlandish kinds of fabrications and what have you about Joseph and the gold plates. When he says persecution became more bitter and severe than before, we have to acknowledge he's talking about a very severe persecution because he tells us he had experienced bitter persecution after the first vision and that after Moroni came, he experienced uh, persecution. 
And now he's saying the work has commenced, and what Moroni told me up on the hill was uh, beginning to display itself with incredible intensity, and persecution was more bitter than before. Well, when he came home from the hill, he secreted the plates in an old birch log in the woods, and he didn't take them home. In fact, I think it was probably a day and a half later that he went back to the woods and got them because uh, he, he was forewarned that his enemies were looking for them. So here we have Lucy Mack telling us how he found an old birch log on the way home. Uh, he took his pocket knife out. Uh, he cut the bark back. He turned it back and made a hole of sufficient size to receive the plates, replaced the bark, and laid uh, an interesting phrase of hers, some old stuff that happened to lay near over it to conceal it. And there he deposited them. Well, when he goes to pick the plates up again, again, to retrieve them from the log, he was, uh, Lucy says, met by what appeared to be a man who demanded the plates and struck him with a club on his side, which was all black and blue. He knocked the man down, ran for home, was much out of breath. When he arrived home, he handed the plates in at the window, and they were, were received from him by his mother. Now, this is the testimony of Martin Harris. Martin Harris is telling us the story. So Martin Harris reported this um, in 1834, I believe, in an, uh, to an interviewer who came and asked him about his experiences with the Prophet Joseph Smith. Lucy said three men assailed him, and when he arrived home, he had a dislocated thumb, and his father had to put him back together. The interesting thing about him handing the plates in at the window and then being received by his mother is that there were a number of people waiting for him in the room to bring the plates back. Um, Josiah Stoll was one, Father Knight was another, and all of his family. I do not know that Martin Harris was there, but when the plates were handed in the window, Catherine says, I took them. We have an account, his mother took them. Josiah's soul says, I took them. And William says, they came in through the window and father took them and put them in a pillowcase uh, for hiding. They were already wrapped up in Joseph's frock coat. Nevertheless, all of these people are standing at the window waiting for these plates and observing what's happening. I don't know why they didn't go to the door, but Joseph came and threw them in through the window and they took them. And Martin Harris says those plates weighed probably 40 to 50 pounds and other persons who lifted them said 60. Now Willard Chase is a neighbor of Joseph's in Palmyra and he claimed that he had been approached by Joseph to make him a container for the plates prior to their removal from the hill, but he declined. And so Hiram uh, gave him the needed chest in the absence of one ready-made. This chest was not given to Joseph prior to his getting the plates, but afterward. And there you have a picture of that chest, but this is not the only receptacle for those plates as we know because we uh, have heard several stories of the different places that Joseph put the plates. So they hid them under the hearth in his father's house. Then they moved them to the cooper shop. And then uh, they put them under the floor there. And then Joseph was told by the Lord to move them, and he took them out from under the, the floor. And they were in this particular glass box that Mr. Beeman made for him, and he put them up in the top of the cooper shop with the flax, uh, Lucy says. And Martin says at a certain time they were kept in a cherry box that was made for that purpose. Mr. Beeman, who, who made the uh, adaptation of the Ontario glass box that glass was delivered in uh, to builders, sawed off the ends of the glass box and made it the right length to put it in, and this is what Joseph had them in when he went to Harmony. So Lucy says, here's a woman by the name of Sally Chase, and she had this piece of green glass, and she could see many wonderful things, and among the rest of her discoveries, she said she'd found out the exact place where Joseph Smith kept his Bible. Now this is the sister of Willard Chase, who said, I was asked to make a, a box, but I didn't do it. 
Well, she's the individual who guides them to the Cooper shop, and um, they ransack it and tear it to pieces. Now their neighbor down the road, uh, being interviewed by probably Pomeroy Tucker, a, a writer and editor and, and journalist of the time, said, the neighbors used to claim that Sally Chase could look at the stone she had and see money. Willard Chase used to dig when she found where the money was. Don't know if anybody ever found any of the money. Now one of the problems here, according to Martin Harris, is that the money diggers claimed they had as much right to the plates as Joseph did, as they were in company together. Now, um, Larry C. Porter indicates that there were money diggers in Palmyra who went down into Harmony at the same time Joseph did when he went down to work for Josiah Stoll. These people had a quote-unquote agree agreement when they were in Harmony that when they were looking for the silver mine, they would equally claim the property, but they don't have any claim on Joseph Smith with the gold plates. But when we are in Palmyra, they claimed, according to Martin, that Joseph had been a traitor and had appropriated to himself that which belonged to them. So for this reason, he says, Joseph was afraid of them and continued sealing the, concealing the plates. So now we still have Martin talking. And Martin tells us, everything was at a fever pitch. And uh, it had become such that some had threatened to mob Joseph to tar and feather him. And they said he would never leave town until he had shown the plates. And so it wasn't safe for him to remain. He wrote to his brother-in-law, Alva, requesting him to come for, for him. Now we know that prior to this time, Joseph and Emma went back to Harmony to get her belongings. And while, while they were there, um, Isaac Hale said to Joseph Smith, I want you to come down here, get a farm, work hard, set yourself up in business, and, uh, and I will help you. And they had agreed to do that. And now that was in August of uh, 1828. And now here we are in the autumn of 1828. And, and Joseph's getting ready to move there because of the persecution. And Martin talks to us about this. And so Martin says, I advised Joseph that he must pay all his debts before starting. I paid them for him, which he did. And in addition to that, he gave him $50. He said, I paid them for him and furnished him money for the journey. Joseph didn't have two cents. I advised him to take enough time to get ready so that he might start a day or two in advance, for he would be mobbed if it was known when he started. Now, it became known that he was going to leave on a certain day. And what happened here was he took Martin, uh, Martin's advice and left a couple of days prior to that. So Martin is helping him get ready, and he says, we, meaning I was there, put the plates in a barrel, one-third full of beans, and headed it up. I informed Mr. Hale, Alva, who is Emma's brother and about age 35, of the matter, and I told him and Joseph to cut a good cudgel and put into the wagon with them, which they did, so that they could defend themselves. It was understood they were to start on Monday, but they started on Saturday night and got through safe. This was the last of October 1827. It might have been the first of November. In actuality, it was December. Martin Harris was convinced enough to hand Joseph $50 um, in moving expenses in public. This was in a public house. We don't know where, but many people were there, including strangers. At the same time, comment, commenting, I give this to you to do the Lord's work with, no, I give it to the Lord for his own work. So Joseph Smith says, Because of his faith and this righteous deed, the Lord appeared unto him in a vision. And um, he refers, um, Emma, his mother refers to this and says, He immediately went to Susquehanna and the Lord had shown him. He had to go get some of the characters. And so he wanted to do that, so he followed Joseph down there. Now, this is what Joseph says about this. The Lord appeared unto Martin in a vision and showed unto him his marvelous work, which he was about to do. 
And he immediately came to Susquehanna and said the Lord had shown unto him that he must go to New York with some of the characters. So we proceeded to copy some of them, and he took his journey to the eastern cities. So now we have uh, Martin Harris intent on learning for an absolute cer certainty that these characters were true, and apparently um, he was endeavoring to satisfy himself before he put any more money into this particular work. But nevertheless, he went down there, and it was February when he got there, and um, he asked, or he had been motivated by this vision to do so. Now Joseph in The Pearl of Great Price in Joseph Smith History says, It was according to Martin's aid that I got to Harmony, and when I got there I started the study of the characters. I didn't just start translating. Now we have already discussed and we know that Joseph was not to translate the plates until Martin had already had the experience which established that the learned couldn't translate it, the book. But Joseph says, I copied these characters off, and I, by the means of the Yerman Thumb, translated some of them. And I did this between, between the time I arrived in December and February. Now what you see here on the page is what is supposed to be, is purported to be, a copy of the characters that Joseph Smith copied off the plates and is supposed to be the uh, fragment that Martin Harris took with him. So Joseph says in February he came, he got the characters, and he started with them to the city of New York. Um, for what took place, I'm going to refer to his testimony, he says. When we look at this particular group of characters, they are supposed to be, according to experts, a little crudely drawn. Um, that may be and may not be. I don't know anything about that. But what we have is uh, either the copy that Joseph wrote or a copy of the copy that Joseph wrote. And where these came from uh, are they came with uh, the printer's copy to the RLDS church as a donation from David Whitmer. And supposition is that at some point Martin Harris gave those characters to David Whitmer to put with the transcript of the Book of Mormon that he already owned so that all of those things would be in a package together. Whether they are the original, absolute original or not, I don't know. Some scholars say for sure that they are. Now we're going to take Martin's testimony here and then we will quit and pick up with what Charles Anson had to say about it when we come back. So Martin says, I went to New York and I presented the characters with the translation to Professor Charles Anthon. Charles Anthon was very much celebrated for his literary attainments. He knew something of languages, but the reality is that at this particular time, nobody really knew much about the languages Joseph was dealing with. Uh, he, nobody knew about Reformed Egyptian, but very few people had any understanding at all of ancient Egyptian or hieroglyphics and so forth. Professor Anton stated that the translation was correct, more so than any he had before seen translated from the Egyptian. I then showed him uh, those which were not yet translated, and he said they were Egyptian, Chaldaic, Assyriac, and Arabic. They were true characters and gave me a certificate saying that the translation was correct and so forth. He took the certificate, put it in his pocket. Mr. Anthon called him back, asked him where the young man got the gold plates and where they were found, and I answered an angel of God had revealed it to him. He then said, let me see the certificate. I took it out of my pocket and gave it to him. He tore it to pieces, saying there isn't any such thing as ministering of angels, and that if I would bring the plates to him, he would translate them. 
So I informed him that part of the plates were sealed, and I was forbidden to bring them. And he replied, I cannot read a sealed book. And I left him and went to Dr. Mitchell, who sanctioned what Professor Anthon had said respecting both the characters and the translation. Now, um, let's see if I said up here I didn't. Mr. Um, Anthon, who was a, a professor of antiquities at Columbia University in New York, was a man of incredible stature, probably out of all the persons in the United States who might have made a judgment on these things, the most esteemed individual to do it. Um, he was a bachelor. He was uh, extremely brilliant and uh, had so many honors on his way up through school that they stopped giving them to him so that other students could get some. And I'm going to just give you, for fun, Father Knight's account of what happened here. And obviously, this is after Martin told, uh, has told it to Joseph and to Father Knight. And some of it's perhaps a little bit quaint, but it's kind of a fun little account. Martin went to Albany and to Philadelphia and to New York. And he found men that could translate some of the characters in all of those places, Mitchell and Anthony. Um, meaning Charles Anthon, of New York, were the most learned. But there were some characters they could not well understand. Therefore, Anthony told him that he thought if he had the original, he could translate it. And he wrote a very good piece to Joseph and said if he would send the original, he would translate it. Now, what he's saying here is in that certificate um, that, Martin, or that Charles Anthon tore up, he indicated he would be glad to try to interpret it if, the plates were sent to him. But at last Martin Harris told him that he could not have the original, for it was commanded of God that they not be shown. What does this mean, he said, and he tore the paper that he wrote it all to pieces and stamped it under his feet, and says, bring me the original or I will not translate it. Mr. Harris, seeing he was in a passion, said, well, I will go home and see, and if they can be had, I will write you immediately. So he came home and told how it was, and they went to him no more, and then it was fulfilled, the, the 29th chapter of Isaiah. Now he, Joseph, being an unlearned man, didn't know what to do. Then the Lord gave him the power to translate himself. Then were the learned men confounded, for he, by the means he found with the plates, he could translate those characters better than the learned. So this is kind of a fun place for us to quit, and we'll pick up here with uh, some more of Martin Harris's experiences, and then we'll go forward with those of the other um, witnesses. Probably not in quite this degree, but it'll be fun. So I'm glad that you were able to be with us this morning in class, and I thank you all, and we will be back on this on Wednesday. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. Thank you.